Okay, there I seem to be. Um, but now I have to figure out what happened with my my chat because uh, not seeing my chat anymore on YouTube. Hmm. Are you seeing me on YouTube, uh, Michelle? Uh, let me check. Oh, this must be this must be on YouTube, but you are. You're but, alive. We're live. But I'm not seeing my chat. So I'm not sure why I'm not. Yeah, I think the chat's the fun part. <laughs> Yeah, just a minute. Um, let's see. Hmm. That's odd. My husband says that being in the chat is really nerdy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's just not working. Are are you seeing the chat at all? Yes. I see the chat. Kimberly is in there. Okay. Um I, I apologize, folks. I'm trying to get this worked out um and uh, i do see something happening but let's see youtube wants to um, do something but let me go back here maybe i can I think I might know a way to do it if I go to my own channel and oh there we go I see Kimberly now okay all right so I'm sorry I got confused here folks but um, something happened so we can begin and I will uh, do my best to edit this early part out um, when when the session is over. Um, so uh, I'm going to read the last paragraph from the previous uh, from the previous chapter um, again, so that you understand what it is that we're doing. Um, because that was cut off from the previous one. Um, and so here's, here's what Jung says in the last part that we read last week. Take your God with you. Bear him down to your dark land where people live who rub their eyes each morning and yet always see only the same thing and never anything else. Bring your God down to the haze pregnant with poison but not like those blinded ones who try to illuminate the darkness with lanterns, which it does not comprehend. Instead, secretly carry your God to a hospitable roof. The huts of men are small, and they cannot welcome the God, despite their hospitality and willingness. Hence, do not wait until rawly bungling hands of men hack your God to pieces but embrace him again lovingly until he has taken on the form of his first beginning. Let no human eye see the much-loved, terribly splendid, but one in the state of his illness and lack of power. Consider that your fellow men are animals without knowing it. So long as they go to pasture or lie in the sun or suckle their young or mate each other, they are beautiful and harmless creatures of dark mother earth. 
But if the God appears, they begin to rave, since the nearness of God makes people rave. They tremble with fear and fury and suddenly attack one another in fratricidal struggles. Since one senses the approaching God in the other, so conceal the God that you have taken with you. Let them rave and maul each other. Your voice is too weak for those raging to be able to hear. Thus do not speak and do not show the God, but sit in a solitary place and sing incantations in the ancient manner. Set the egg before you, the God in his beginning, and behold it and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze. Okay, there is a lot in this paragraph. And I think the the point here is that Isdabar, uh, who's Gilgamesh in the in the previous uh, form, um, is actually Jung's God. Okay, and he's trying to bring that God back together. And ultimately, he he has wounded his God by telling that his God facts of the physical world. And yet, there we live in two worlds, um, and they are both this one. And one world is in our unconscious. And so, uh, Jung's point is that there is a a God that directs all of our actions within us, but it's different for for every person. And if we start to explain it, then others will say, um, no, no, you're wrong about that. It's not like that. It's like this. And then, um, and then we have religious wars and we, that's been going on for thousands of years <coughs> excuse me and um and so in order to avoid that you be true to your own god okay and here perhaps we could say in a union sense that um God that we've all been brought up with, regardless of our religion, um, is a metaphor for ourself, for what drives us, for what makes us get up in the morning, which makes us, you know, eat our dinner, uh, our bodies re rejuvenate uh, every seven years, every cell in our body changes with maybe with the exception of bone cells. And um, and with the exception of the brain, I guess. And so um, there, there's a lot going on unconsciously and in the unconscious. And, and we're not aware of that. I mean, we're not aware of 90% of our life, basically, because all of that has to do with supporting our lives. I mean, we we see the big things like a nice meal or uh, toileting or whatever, uh, but we don't see um, what's going on um, in our in our bodies to keep us going. And so, um, and I'll, I'll be interested. Uh, if Judith has a has a comment about this, I don't know if you've been hearing this, Judith, but I, I've been giving a commentary that probably is a bit controversial, um, where um, Jung is um, Jung is saying, "Keep your keep your God to yourself, basically." Okay, and um, and. So I've been in, interpreting this that in this sense, I think that 
Jung is using the term God as a metaphor for the self. And he's saying, if you start saying anything about your God, you're going to have immediate dissenters, no matter who you are. I mean, even if you're the most evangelical of evangelicals and you, um, you know, you preach the, the evangelical story, even then you'll have people who at least in their in their quiet self are disagreeing with you in some way um and and so he's saying you really have to keep your your god to yourself don't bring him out in in him or her God doesn't actually have a gender. God is is what keeps us going, but it's there's no such thing as a gender for God. So it's not him or her, um, and so on. But as soon as I say that, uh, you know, that there'll be a thousand dissenters on this email or on this uh, video will say, oh, no, 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 there, you know, as soon as I say that, then, then people will disagree. And, and so what Jung is saying is, uh, don't even talk about it. Your God is your God, and you should keep it to yourself. And so, because if you don't, you bring it up into the physical world where we have religious wars over stuff like um, people drawing images of the prophet, peace be upon him. And, and thousands of people therefore die because another group says, no, you can't ever draw a picture of the, of the prophet. And then there's, you know, we have all this battle royal going on. And we see it in, in all religions, not only in Islam, but in, in all religions. As soon as you say the least little thing about God, you're going to have dissenters. Uh, do you have a comment on that, too? Well, I mean, obviously, people put so much... Um, identity on their relationship with God. And to me, when he says this, it feels like take the identity or identifying yourself out of it. Don't take this as your identity out in the world and, and wear it, you know? Yeah. It's, it's your very transpersonal, intrapersonal experience. And I also feel that we, he was allowing with his wide range of mind and heart God to show up in whatever archetypal or mythic or tangible or intangible form that God, you know, it's all God in a certain way, but it, it's going to come up in different ways uh, for individuals, yeah. groups of individuals. And that's my sense of it, that, yeah. Don't wear it as identity. And, you know, I think Buddha and for sure said even, you know, don't make images of me. Yeah. And so sure. when he, was, you know, first, um, the first thing that they ever did where they started to break that tradition was they, they just made his footprints as a sculpture. And that yeah. was representing, you know, the Buddha, the awake. But, you know, we love to... Um, <laughs> We love to be creative, right? And form and take non-form into form. And so I think sure. it goes all different, all different ways. And it can be useful or it can be a negative identity, which then makes me really different from you or you really different from somebody who believes different, you know, yeah. and how much strife that causes. That's my take on it. Right. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, is it Lynn? Is that is that our our other? Yes. Uh, yes. Good morning, uh, good morning yeah. Lynn. So, uh, do you have any comment on this? I have some coming up on YouTube, but I'll hold them until you're you've opined if you want to. Well, for me, it's always a question of of unity and diversity, 
And as soon as you move into diversity, even the most subtle, somebody else's diversity is going to be different than mine. Exactly. Everybody. So if you're not at in the point in your consciousness where you're more identified with the unity and welcoming the diversity, then I'm going to see somebody else's diversity as being against mine or opposed to mine or even with mine, either, either one uh, causes a clutching uh, of identity. Right. Um, did, did either of you in your psychological training uh, have anything like this um, said to you that you should, you have to think of it in this way? I'm, I'm just curious about whether psychology Thinking of, of your spiritual orientation or your religious right, right, orientation. Right. Yeah. Well, I went to a Buddhist inspired graduate school. Uh-huh. Naropa University. So it was very much intellect and intuition was the motto, the school <laughs> motto on the, on the, on the school seal. Mm-hmm. And so that intuitive part was invited and the diversity Right, right, right. It's held in a, in a good way, I feel. Better than other groups I've been in where, like Lynn was saying, diversity isn't, it's more cause for opposition or, you know, competition than to hear each other's voice and, and right. receive it. So but it seems... Western psychology yeah. doesn't have much, even though Jung was Western. Western psychology hasn't taken much down this road until now. Right. And, and so even Jung was afraid of talking about it because he knew, I mean, he wrote this in the Red Book, so he was writing it in 1914 and um, at the very beginning of 1914, before the beginning of the war. And he knew that it would be very controversial and he said who would who would understand it and so it's taken us um, 95 years from that time to 2009 uh, before his heirs even allowed this to be published and and he was afraid of it and i think he was partially afraid of it because he grew up with a in a pastor's home and he you know he had had some really distinct experiences as the son of a pastor um and my friend tim holmes who is a sculptor but who's who also grew up in a in a family with six generations back of methodist ministers um you know his parents must have been appalled when he started to bend their silverware when he was 10 years old i mean they they would have been saying you can't do that and he says well uh, you know i'm driven to do this and that's what he did and i think he said that by the time he was 16 he had his own blowtorch i go oh my god (laughs) um and so, anyway, I want to go back to some of these uh, comments from folks on on YouTube. Um, Jonti says, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Michelle says, you're talking about the blind man and the elephant. Jonti says, defining God with external references, a little silly since emergence is the point. Um Eric says, to define God as anything, you would abnegate other characteristics of it as possible, a possibility. It is almost inevitable misunderstanding would be caused in attempting to define the undefinable. Uh, Michelle says, even priests have to turn to AA recovery, uh, LOL. And Jonzi says, Abraxas shrugs. And, and uh, 
And Anthony says, makes sense, where is so? And he stops. AA was based on Franciscan 12 Steps to Holiness, gasped Joe. Uh, Dionysus says, I do not degree, I do not agree with my my Maimonides, but the way he goes about describing God in negative terms is better than saying positives. So is Jung, and Eric says, so is Jung saying God is subjective by nature, or is it making reference to of an undefinable definable nature? Um, and I, my answer to that is I think he is referring to something that's undefinable by nature, uh, is, is undefinable nature. Uh, and when I say he's self or it's self, it's a metaphor for self, even that, you know, even that comment, uh, immediately brings reactions from people. So I agree that it's undefinable and we shouldn't even try, but it, we can do what, Jung proposed for his whole career, which is to circle the center. Okay, the center where God is is undefinable, and yet we have to all face it at some point in some in our own way. And he's he's basically saying, let's not um, let's not get too wound up about it. Uh, and uh, Eric says, oh, and then John Z says, I will be done, sweet heaven, for we are dumb as hammers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are dumb as hammers. Uh, Eric says, yes, uh, but, but are we saying subjective interpretation of an objective thing or a thing objectively understood as subjective in nature, and um, I would have to respond, yes, you know, it, it can be all, all of the above, uh, and thing is obviously not a great word for God, but just use here for lack of a better term, uh, the magnificent are simply, uh, the magnificent, what simply is, isn't concerned with our preference, thankfully, Jonti says. It's a chip pan fire if, you, if you're if you a serious man. Uh, thankfully, I'm not. Keep your own counsel concerning deity, says Anthony. Uh, fair enough, says Eric. Uh, it's hard to convey tone in a chat. I don't, I'm not being sarcastic you uh, you've given me thoughts to think about things to consider and so i leave it there that's all uh oh well haha i didn't know you would interact with the chat uh for answering the question <laughs> okay um okay and judge says schrodinger's chat uh the deity anyway okay so I do interact with the um, with the chat from time to time because I, you know, it is amusing and interesting to hear how people are reacting. So, Young is basically giving me advice to keep your God to yourself and don't get too wound up about what other people say about God. I think that's the essence of his advice here. And he says, in order to do that, um, it, it would be wise to go back to what the ancients did, which was to go into incantations. Okay, so that's how we're, that's the setup for what the ancients were doing, the incantations, which is the, the title of this chapter. Okay, so I'm going to read these in, incantations. I'm going to read each one twice. And um, 
and that'll give you a chance to first get a sense of what he's saying in the incantation. I'm on page 299 of the of the uh, of the reader's edition, and here here they are. And in in the red book, he has done beautiful paintings of these incantations. By the way, he's done beautiful um, sort of paintings of oriental rugs that include these words and are calligraphic in their form. Uh, but So here you're only getting the words, you're not getting the images, the actual physical images that he put into the Red Book. And I urge you, if you haven't done so, you know, get your library to send you a Red Book by interlibrary loan or whatever, if you can't afford it, uh, get yourself to a red book so that you could actually look through the original because the original makes a huge, huge difference. I can't even begin to tell you. Um, and I got my red book for Christmas, I think in 2010. And um, I think it, and I, I just could not put a mark in it. Okay, in other words, I mark everything, including the reader's edition. Okay, I mark everything that I read, but uh, it was, it's so beautiful. I, I simply could not mark it. And so I was hugely relieved when they made the reader's edition available uh, so that I could mark it up. And so I've even bought a podium to put my red book on. And I keep that podium in my living room as a standing desk with the red book on top of it so that I can go to it at any time and refer to it. Uh, and, you know, for me, I find that book sacred. Okay. And uh, I can't, I won't even begin to tell you why, but I find it sacred. And I always have. And um, and I acknowledge that there are other religious books that are also sacred. I don't doubt that, not for a minute. Um, but this one really hit me when I saw it. So incantations, here's the first one. Christmas has come. The God is in the egg. I have prepared a rug for my God, an expensive red rug from the land of mourning. I shall be surrounded by the shimmer of magnificence of east of his eastern land. I am the mother, the simple maiden who gave birth and did not know how. I am the careful father who protected the maiden. I am the shepherd who received the message as he guarded his herd at night on the dark fields. Okay, so that's the first one. And the footnote that applies to it says, Luke 2, 8 through 11. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be it to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Okay, unquote. And so um, that is a reference that Shamdasani puts in as a footnote saying this is what Jung was talking about. And uh, Judith, as you look at the Red Book, um, it's uh, the chapter called Incantations, which you can find in the contents first to find the page that we're talking about. Um, And so I'm going to read it, read it once more. Uh, it obviously has a Christian reference here. 
And, and Shem Dasani in the footnote is pointing that out to us. So here's, here's the incantation again. Christmas has come. The God is in the egg. I have prepared a rug for my God, an expensive red rug from the land of mourning. Uh, he shall be surrounded by the shimmer of magnificence of his eastern land. I am the mother, the simple maiden, who gave birth and did not know how. I am the careful father who protected the maiden. I am the shepherd who received the message as he guarded his herd at night on the dark fields. Okay, so that's incantation one, uh, number one. Okay, this, the second incantation is, I am the holy animal that stood astonished and cannot grasp the becoming of the God. I am the wise man who came from the east, suspecting the miracle from afar. And I am the egg that surrounds and nurtures the seed of the God in me. Okay, so there is a footnote to that one as well. Again, it's a reference. Uh, to the Bible, and the reference is Matthew 2, 1 through 2. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Okay, so that's uh, the story of the three kings from the Bible. Uh, and so now I'll read the incantation once again. I am the holy animal that stood astonished and cannot grasp the becoming of the God. I am the wise man who, man who came from the east, suspecting the miracle from afar. And I am the egg that surrounds and nurtures the seed of the God in me. Okay, so here he's asserting that the seed of the God is within himself. Um, and so going on. Um, all right, the third incantation. The solemn hours lengthen, and my humanity is wretched and suffers torment, since I am a giver of birth. Where do you delight me, O God? He is the eternal emptiness and the eternal fullness. Nothing resembles him, and he resembles everything. Eternal darkness and et eternal brightness. Eternal below and eternal above. Double nature in one simple in the manifold, meaning in absurdity, freedom in bondage, subjugated with when victorious, old in youth, yes in no. Okay, so there's a, a footnote here. The attributes of God in this section are elaborated as the attributes of Abraxas in the second and third sermons in scrutinies okay so scrutinies is a later part of the red book and uh, shamdasani is referring to the seven sermons to the dead uh which um jung said later on uh because he initially wrote it um uh, anonymously <laughs> he didn't want people to know where it had come from um, but later he admitted it. Um, he published, he printed up copies of it in the mid 19 teens and passed it out to some of his friends um, and attributing it to a, a prophet in old Alexandria uh, who, uh, who I believe was uh, a Gnostic, um, and this is where the the whole thing of hanging Gnosticism on on Jung had its origins. He regretted later doing it. He said that it was uh, an action of youthful exuberance. So, 
he was around 40 years old when he did that. And uh, he, he regretted it for a long time because it was, he couldn't explain it well. And, um, and the war was on by then. And, and so it sort of got swept under the rug. And it's only when the, when the Red Book was published in 2009 that we see they see it published again in scrutinies but that's a later part so um i, will Skip, I have a comment yes uh, please you had asked earlier if there were any uh psychological or current um teachings or uh, processes that relate to this. And as I was reading this last incantation, what occurred to me is that uh, what he's doing here, putting um, uh, light and dark, um, freedom and bondage, he's, he's putting those two things together, almost like matter and antimatter. Mm -hmm. And that is done in several different techniques where you can take, a person you're working with and say, can you let this be as important as it is and as meaningless as it is? Can you let this be as terrible and as wonderful? And you and you take them back and forth, you toggle mm -hmm. between the extremes of diversity in an attempt to have that have the whole structure collapse and have them move into a place of peace with it. It, yeah. it is a technique, and I love that he's doing that here. Simple and manifold, meaning and absurdity, just this back and forth motion of allowing the mind to move back and forth and have it be so rapid that eventually the whole structure collapses. Yeah, and of course, we're seeing the U.S. Supreme Court do that in current events now. Um, because uh, what the consequences of what they did in the in the last week are incalculable, and um, obviously lots of people were very happy about what they did, and you know now we're we're seeing that Abraxas or or whoever, regardless of whose God you want to refer to, <laughs> is, is now going to show us the, the blowback from that. And, you know, I, this is why um, years ago, around the year 2000, I was traveling heavily in the Middle East and very often Saudi Arabia. And I was... I was actually producing a YouTube, um, or I'm sorry, I was producing a television program. Um, and I was interviewing um, intellectuals in the, in the Muslim world a lot. And um, I was asking the question, which I did not know the answer to, and maybe still don't, but I was asking the question, what one factor above all other factors um, makes the United States the strong, at least the strongest militarily and financially in the world? What one factor does that? And it was a stump the stars question. Nobody knew. Okay. And I never got a I never really got a cogent answer out of it. But what that did was it caused me to look at that question time and time and time again. And what finally dawned on me is that the fundamental strength of the United States is our diversity. Okay. And what I was seeing in the Arab world, the Muslim world, is that where people are requiring other people to think one way and no other, um, they have huge problems because of that. There are, there are colossal problems. 
And even in Islam, we have the big uh, rift between the Sunnis and the Shiites, and then we ha also have the uh, the Sufis, and and so those are the, those are huge rifts that are still with the with Islam, and of course in in the West we have um, Christianity. Uh, dividing first in two uh, between Catholicism and Protestantism, and then Catholicism itself dividing into five five brands of Catholicism, uh, including you know Russian Orthodox, Orthodox, etc. and and Protestantism dividing into 400 uh, or more sects. And you know, even, uh, the Methodists, who uh, who Tim Holmes comes from, uh, have have now uh, had a had a division in their church uh, over the issue of uh, whether um, I think over whether women should be in the clergy or not, and so we see these rifts coming up as soon as somebody takes a position somebody else has another position and but but what happens with diversity is uh usually we can resolve these issues over time and it's a strengthening factor um whereas uh in a in a place like turkey where there are, is autocratic leadership or uh, Egypt, um, you know, there, there just is no agreement and all there is is autocratic control. And so, um, you know, the sum, the sum of that is that we have to find room for everybody's God. Okay, in other words, when you go to the grocery store and you see a woman in hijab, you know, she doesn't affect your life. You know, she may be in the aisle where you're pulling out your cake recipe, your cake mix or whatever it is, but she's not affecting your life. And, and we have to, and that's the way we live. Actually, that's the way we live in the United States where, you know, we, we really don't think of it think a, at all about having broad diversity um everywhere we go to movie theaters and movie theaters what have you uh and we used to obviously very badly in the south and now you know it 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 erupted in the civil war obviously and that was a bread and butter issue for the South because their whole economy was based on slavery and they couldn't, you know, give that up. But now we have, um, you know, this Southern attitude um, coming back very virulently in things like uh, Ron DeSantis and what he, what he's done, and now he's made it so you can have open carry in in uh, Florida. So that means that any Tom, Dick, and Harry can be walking down the down the street with an AR-15 and locked and loaded. You know, in the in the U.S. Marines, we don't give Marines weapons. Okay, we do not give Marines weapons, and and uh, the military throughout history has kept the weapons in the armories. Okay, in in the Marines, weapons are kept in an armory uh, under lock and key. And when I was in OCS in the Marine Corps, we used to have to go to the armory, armory physically every day and check out our weapon. We were not allowed to have our weapon. And when we were in the basic school as a second lieutenant, we were allowed to keep our weapon, but it had to stay locked 
to our bunk, except when we were physically uh, using it in training. But ne no other time were we allowed to have our weapon. And there's a reason for that. Uh, military is, is young men, and they make mistakes. <laughs> I mean, even in Vietnam, we, you know, weapons were kept in the armory, except if you were actually using them. So anyway, uh, I, do, I digress, but um, let, let's read this one more time, this incantation. Uh, the solemn hours lengthen, and my humanity is wretched and suffers torment, since I am a giver of birth. Whence do you delight me, O God? He is the eternal emptiness and the eternal fullness. Nothing resembles him, and he resembles everything. Eternal darkness and eternal brightness. Eternal below and eternal above. Double nature in one. Simple in the manifold. Meaning in absurdity. Freedom in bondage. Subjugated when victorious. Old in youth. Yes and no. Okay. Are there any, I'm, I'm not going to, the, the YouTube chat has been going wild here, um, but I'm not going to read it all because I want to get through the book here. So we're going to read the, the next incantation, but do, do either of you in the panel have uh, any further comment on what I said? I just want I just want to see it as an exercise that this incantation is an exercise not in going more to the extremes but in going back and forth between them and therefore allowing it all to settle into the unity of it to absolutely to, to actually use it almost as a proprioceptive exercise in going back and forth so that the mind exhausts itself. You know, when you're working with a, a body, sometimes you, you make the muscle that's in spasm, you actually take it further into the spasm so that it gives up, so that it exhausts itself. And then the whole structure can reevaluate and reform itself into a better pattern. And I'm seeing this as what he's doing here to go back and forth between yes and no, up and down, high and low, black and white. And then to allow all of that to just give up and let go. And for just a moment to, to experience the peace in between the extremes. Absolutely. Um, so the next incantation, oh, light of the middle way enclosed in the egg, embryonic, full of ardor, oppressed, fully expectant, dreamlike, awaiting lost memories, as heavy as stone, hardened, molten, transparent, streaming bright, coiled on itself. Let's see, is there a footnote there? I guess not, uh, but there should be. As Judith would tell us, um, O light of the middle way. Okay, so uh, in Buddhism, uh, one is taught the middle way. Okay, and obviously in Taoism too. The Tao is the middle way. Right, it's, it's holding the ambiguity. The middle way is holding both to, you know, to allow yourself to feel like Lynn was talking about toggling back and forth and in oh, Dharma, the middle way. I say it again. I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it's like the middle way can be said to be holding the ambiguity, you know, the yes in the no, the manifold in the unity, the, and the path of, of Buddhist tradition has a lot to do with holding both rather than either or. Right, and, and um, Dionysus refers to Aristotle's golden mean. I, f I found this particular version of the 
of the yin yang symbol to be sort of a enlightening moment because here um it's showing us that it's in everything and that you know there's there's a counterpart for everything um and so we see white dolphins and black dolphins and so and so on so anyway um i just wanted to share that as you know it's not just the yin yang symbol it is everything so i'll read it one more time a light of the middle way enclosed in the egg embryonic full of ardor oppressed fully expectant dreamlike awaiting lost memories as heavy as stone hardened molten transparent streaming bright coil on itself anything else you want to say just wondering if you think he's referring to the Ouroboros coiled on itself, streaming oh, of course. Great. Yes, of course. Um, right. He is uh, referring to the Ouroboros. And, uh, and if you want to have, you know, a full dissertation on the Ouroboros, you can read uh, Neumann's book, um, The Origins of... Um, consciousness or something like that it's that's not exactly the name but um here i have it here i keep it close the origins and history of consciousness and about half of this book is about the Ouroboros. and you know and when i was reading it the first time I think I have to admit I've only read it one time. Um, I, found, I found it got a little tedious. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, Sham Desani could easily have put in footnotes about um, either the Ouroboros or the fact that um, the middle way is, is the way of Buddhism and also the way of Taoism, of course. And... Uh, You know, it's it's also the story of the Bhagavad Gita if you if you look at it, okay, because the the Bhagavad Gita is um, looking at the armies on both sides and realizing that they are both kinsmen. Um, and in an instant. All right. So the next one is Amen, you are Lord of the beginning. Amen, you are star of the east. Amen, you are flower that blooms over everything. Amen, you are the deer that breaks out of the forest. Amen, you are the song that sounds far over the water. Amen, you are the beginning and the end. There are a couple of footnotes here. In dreams, Jung noted on January 3rd, 1917, in Libra Nova's snake image in, incent, I don't know what that is. Uh, this notation appears to refer to this image. And, uh, okay, so it's referring, I, Anyway, in Dreams, which is a is a book of Jung's that was written in 1917, he seems to be referring back to this image in the Red Book. And so that's one thing. 127, footnote 127, image legend Brahmanaspati. Julius Eglin notes that... Uh, Brihaspati or Brahmanaspati, the Lord of Prayer or Worship, takes the place of Agni. Agni is fire, I believe, as the yes. representative of the priestly dignity. In the Rig Veda, number 10, 68 to 69, Brihaspati is said to have found Avindar, the dawn, the sky, and the fire, Agni, and to have chased away the darkness with his light, Arca, sun. 
he seems rather to represent the element of fire and uh, of light and fire generally. In Sacred Books of the East, volume 12, page uh, XVI, which is uh, 16 in the, apparently in the foreword. And, okay, so there, it refers to another footnote as well. And so um, I'll just read the incantation again. Amen, you are the Lord of the beginning. Amen, you are the star of the east. Amen, you are the flower and blooms that blooms over everything. Amen, you are the deer that breaks out of the forest. Amen, you are the song that sounds far over the water. Amen, you are the beginning and the end. Uh, do either of you want to comment on the deer that was breaking out of the forest? Um, well, the deer uh, in in the uh, Eastern, in Rig Veda and in other Eastern traditions is Krishna. So, oh, okay. I, oh, there's uh, the egg. Look at that. Yeah, that's that's an important image from the Red Book. Wow. Um, that's gorgeous. Thank you, Judith. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah. Judith. Um, and I actually, I actually have a lot of these images. I can make it more visible uh, if I pull them up, um, because they we ought to look at it more closely. I think it's hard to hold up the 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 red book the way you should hold it up <laughs> because it's so very yeah, heavy. Yeah, not heard it. Uh, but uh, let me see if I can find it here in the images. I I do have that one for sure. Uh, you know, this all uh, as I'm as I'm listening to you and as I'm watching Judith, it also occurs to me that what he's doing here by holding us in this place of active imagination and imagery. Is I remember someone talking once about the paintings of Monet. They're so amazing because they show the surface and they show what's under the surface and they show what's on top of the surface all at the same time. And what he's doing here is holding us all in active imagination. And he's also pointing out the extremes of diversity and he's also holding unity all at the same time in these incantations. So right. they are an exercise in holding us all in all three places at once, if we allow it. Right. And uh, so here's here's the image, and I found a number a number of the other images as well. So um, so here's the image uh, that the YouTube group can look at more closely here, um, and uh, and you see lots of things happening. Uh, but there is a mandala. Uh, there is the tree of life. There is creepy crawlies down in the earth and under the earth and uh, lots of other things. And uh, it's a very, very powerful image, it seems to me. And he's drawn it here as an egg rather than a mandala. He has the mandala within the egg. Um, and you can find lots of reference here to lots of things which I'm not going to go into because we're not about that. But uh, I do want to uh, just give a sense of what the, um, uh, what the, what these incantations look like in the red book. Let me just go back to the ones I found here just to see a couple of them. Okay. All right. So here is one example. And I don't know which one it is offhand, but um, just just to give you a sense of how much care he put into this. So um, he, you know, he definitely really, really thought about what he was saying and uh, wanted to make it quite beautiful and an incantation, something that's looking ancient and so on so you know this is where 
although these these Im these imaginations that he went through in now about a two and a half week period from from Christmas night of 1913 and we're now up to about December I'm sorry January 12th 1914 we're before the war uh and he's having this imagery and this this is the kind of imagery that he was thinking of when he was talking about uh the incantation so just to give you a, a sense of it uh let's see if I have one more here that I, I love the design that he embellished the text with. It was full of little cosmic eggs. Right. You know, it was mostly egg shaped. And right. Inc and, you know, incantation means magic spell. What uh, do you think about that, Skip, that he called it incantation? You know, the actual definition is a series of words said as a magic spell or charm. As yeah, in an incantation to raise the dead. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's what what he was saying. That it was, you know, the that the ancients knew. What he's saying is that the ancients knew viscerally um, what they had to do. Okay, I mean, this is what mm -hmm. prayer is now. Okay, um, or meditation. We know what we need to do, okay? And so, um, it if we do it, we can feel it, okay? You don't have to believe in any given religion, but uh, I'll just uh, give you a sense of it. I'm I'm doing what we call Rockies as a as a meditation practice now because. I in just since April, since I was shown it by Colleen Kiber, uh, and I started to do it, I found that this is really my meditation practice. It, um, you know, I my wife is a is a you know fully realized Buddhist Lama without the she didn't take uh, it ordination, but. She meditates about two to three hours a day and uh, is very much into it and has been since 1994. Um, and ultimately, she did the three-year retreat that would make you a, a lama. Uh, she did it at home. It took seven years to complete it. Um, she did it as home study, but uh, so she didn't go off to Tibet for three years. Uh, she stayed at our marriage, but she actually went through all the processes that they went through, that they go through. She didn't take ordination, but she's very deeply into it. And so, and I've, I've used uh, Buddhist mantras, you know, thousands of times in my life since 1994 okay I you know I tried to go the Buddhist way but I found that I was going a parallel way which is the the Jungian way and um but somehow mantras didn't quite get it for me in terms of meditation it didn't put me in the right frame of mind and i always knew that i i use them faithfully for and i still use them sometimes for certain purposes but when i started to do these rockies i found this is my meditation technique okay and so you can say the rosary or you can do whatever you want to do in prayer it's all it's all of a piece and uh, so I'll just give you a sense of what is coming out of it, because this is one that I'm just now completing, and I wanted to share it with, with you. I guess I'm going to have to can my background for a minute. Um, 
Skip, I, don't, I just want to tell you that Judith and I have completely taken off on your idea of Iraqi painting, and we've been doing it daily. Oh, cool. So bring, bring, those, yes. bring those with you, because I'm, I'm going to bring a portfolio of mine. And, um, you know, I'm not expecting any, anybody to buy them, but, but because we're uh -huh. doing Rocky at Confluence as a collective uh, unconscious exercise in a big mural, we're going to do it in a 10, 10 yard long mur mural as a group. I wanted to be able to show examples. And so bring your examples too. So that this okay. is my very latest one. This, this one, uh, and the reason I wanted to show it to you is because it has four names, depending on how you look at them. And so looking at it this way, uh, the name is Humpty Dumpty Before the Fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. looking at it this way, uh, and I have a note on this, this is after U.S. Supreme Court rulings on affirmative action, student debt, and LGBTQTIA rights. Uh, I call this, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, this way, I call this Apollo with the crown of thorns. And you can see the crown of thorns up here. Mm -hmm. And this oh, yeah. sweet face of Apollo here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then if you look at it this way, which is the way I'm going to actually write the name on the on the piece, uh, the devil is in the details. Mm. And and so and so That's in terms cool. pardon. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> So, and I had no idea how it would work out. I have not put lines on every on every color boundary here. Uh, and and um, although I've been trying to do that fairly pedantically, I noticed that Colleen doesn't do it. She finds the the image and uh, and then she stops. Okay. And so I started, I, I found, um, you know, Humpty Dumpty before the fall. That was the first one that I found. And, um, and then I start to look the other ways. And, um, and then I keep going until I have a, I have a title for each way. Ah, uh, so you name each each image that comes when you when you flip the paper, right? Great. Yeah. So I put it on the back. I think when I when I put it in my portfolio for confluence, what I'm going to do is just make little stickies showing each way with the title. Yeah. But but the the name that's going to be on this piece is the devil in the details. Okay. The devil is in the details. Or the devil in the details, right? Um, and so this was done totally randomly. I did it with fluorescent paint that was dry. I'm never going to do that again, by the way, because it's powder. And I'm having, if not an allergic reaction to it, the, the particulates in the powder are affecting my breathing. So I, I didn't, I'm not gonna use that approach anymore. You can get fluorescent paint that is liquid fluorescent paint uh, from Saks, I believe it's on Amazon, but I had gotten this, this powder stuff and wow, it's really affecting me. So I, I'm not using that anymore, but I, I did do, uh, I think six random images, you know, just throwing, throwing down the paint, getting something on the paper, and then starting to find the images. And, um, and it's only to, uh, 
tell me about myself. Okay. In other words, I, I've been very, very drawn into these sessions where I literally can't stop. And some mornings I get up and I turn on the coffee and I can't get myself to stop long enough to pour the cup of coffee. Okay. I, I push the, <laughs> I, I, totally start understand. the yeah. I start the machine. Yeah. I, I start the machine and then I can't spare the time uh, to, um, I can't spend, spare the time uh, to get up to pour myself the cup of coffee that comes with it. <laughs> what did I do here? Okay, so I hear you guys drawing a parallel between incantations and mantras and Raki painting. Absolutely. And uh, and now my question is what you just talked about, Skip, that state where you're just impelled, like something's being born, something's coming out, something's being revealed. How does that parallel with the unity of using an incantation or a mantra or a technique or something that allows you to experience unity and peace it, it um, connects you with the collective unconscious absolutely okay and um there's a i just want to add one thing there's yeah, a very interesting there's a phrase in sanskrit that means vibrant absolute mm -hmm. and what's believed in the vedic literature is that the absolute is the nothingness it's the emptiness without right the Right and then the vibrant absolute is that area right above emptiness. And that's the realm of the gods. That's the realm of the angels. That's the realm of the subtle, subtle right. manifestation. Right. And I, and go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, and the reason I know it's the unconscious is because I've actually experienced it. Okay, in other words, um, for, th for the last three months of the school year, I was teaching art at a quote-unquote Title I school, which means that 97.5% of the student body is either Black or Hispanic, basically. Uh, and um, I'll tell you, it's a very, very rough environment, okay, that that particular school was a rough environment for me to teach in, especially since I've never taught. Um, I mean, I, I've been certified to teach since 1968, but I never taught a day K through 12 until last September. But in March, I happened into this opportunity to teach art for three months. And, um, and so it was a very rough environment. Uh, but in the midst of that, I came out to California and uh, Colleen taught me the Rocky technique. And I said, um, well, why don't we do this as a mural at the confluence? And everybody said, yes, especially people that were already doing it in the group. Um, and and so we're going to do it but then i came back to school and i said well geez so i've just been given 300 students maybe i should experiment and try to do a mural uh with these 300 students so i did and in fact i also did it with the youngest kids in other words i was teaching the third through fifth grade and I had a counterpart who was teaching pre-K through second grade. And so I had everybody in the school, all, all 600 children come in and make their mark on this mural and then draw, start drawing the lines. Uh, I only had my classes do the line drawing, but I had everybody put down the basic color. and. Um, and this is what we got. I'm going to share it with you. Um, I'm going to show it first in 
in size with me and my colleague. This is the first time we had unrolled the entire thing. Um, and this was after I had deemed it complete. Um, but in the process, I, and here, here it is cleaned up a bit uh, so that you can see it a little better and I can bring it up closer. But everybody in the school got into that, okay, including mm -hmm. a lot of the staff. And, um, and the result was that I was requested to use it as a backdrop uh, for the fifth grade graduation ceremony. That isn't it, sorry. Um, okay, so this is the setup for the fifth grade graduation ceremony from this class and um, from this school. This is the whole gym is filled with, with chairs. And this is the background for the, these are the fifth grade classes across the front. And this is the backdrop. And so everybody was invested in that. And uh, the unique thing about this school is the whole school, you see this huge mural along one side of the wall. Uh, the whole school is like that. Every, every hallway is like that. Uh, very different from the from the middle school that I had taught in in the spring, where there was a 150 yard long hallway that was all white walls. Um, this school Skip, did the did the staff and students feel some of the magic like that happens with incantation and that happens and you feel there was a quality of, of what was your experience? There's no doubt about it. I mean, everybody that looked at it from the principal on down just uh, thought it was awesome. And, and so it's unconscious. I can't, I can't describe yeah. it. I can't right. describe it. But what that is, is the collective unconscious of all those children and staff members in that period of time. That is a picture of it. And, um, and I literally cannot express what it meant to me or what it meant to the other people. I, I, I wouldn't even venture to say what it meant to the other people. Yeah. But my point is that, that prayer, incantation, human beings have done, done this since the beginning, of, since we could talk, okay? And maybe even before we talked, okay, before we made words about it, um, human beings probably, you know, did gestures or something that, that, Gestures and symbols, right? Gestures yeah. and symbols. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they, you know, they drew it on their walls in the in the cave paintings. But you know, maybe an elder would start the fire and make some motions over the fire. God knows what they might have done. I have no clue. But it's um, but the power of of doing that of the power of prayer is is unpredictable and what jung felt at the beginning of the red book period in in the fall of 1913 was he was feeling the pressure of the collective unconscious for everyone okay everyone in europe he was feeling it intensely okay this was an in highly intuitive man no doubt uh and he so he couldn't in this in the sensing se sense uh, which is the opposite of intuitive of saying well this is this and this is this and this is this he couldn't he couldn't get his 
his words around it, but it was obviously affecting him very, very deeply. And the result of that was that he actually, for a time, wondered if he was going into schizophrenia. Um, and uh, and so it's it's the reason he says that on August 1st, 1914, which was the actual beginning of World War I, where, where the guns of August started to sound. I mean, the crown prince had been murdered in late June, and, you know, then there was a lot of stuff going on, and then the, the, the guns started up. Um, he said he was the happiest man in the world that day because he knew instantly that it, his visioning and images were a common experience. Okay, that's what he knew because he had 12 instances in that run-up period of about 10 months or nine months where he had visioning of horrible events in Europe and the events of World War I, basically. Um, and so, oh my God, you know, so that was his discovery. Okay, so we should go on. Um, we, we have quite a few to go here and we only have 20 minutes left. So let me, let's move on. All right. The next incantation, one word that was never spoken, one light that was never lit, an unparalleled confusion, and a road without end. Okay, this is just what I was talking about. Um, he, you know, he was talking about his unparalleled confusion. He didn't, he didn't know. He was a maid psychiatrist, and he didn't know what was happening. And it was only then that he got it. Okay, so one word that was never spoken, one light that was never lit, an unparalleled confusion, and a road without end. And, um, you know, I remember when I was 30 years old and I was uh, elected a deacon of my Reformed church in Rochester, New York, I was frustrated because the pastor couldn't tell me what God was. He couldn't describe God for me. And, but I knew that every time I went to church, when I came out, I felt better. Okay. I felt better. And I didn't, I didn't know why I just, and because I'm a highly intuitive too, I was actually feeling this pretty deeply that I was beginning my law career and I wasn't liking it very much. I probably hadn't put my mind around the idea that I didn't like it very much um, at that time. I, I had huge confusion because I was pra practicing law, but I, I actually came to realize that I actually detest the practice of law. And so I... I was very confused at a very deep level, and, but I felt better when I went to church. And so in church, we were basically doing a lot of incantations, um, you know, prayer and, um, and various, um, various things that one says together with the other congregation members. And, and so when I came out of church, I would feel better. <laughs> And I think this is because um, we, you know, we were communing unconsciously. Okay, the congregation was communing unconsciously. And just in current events, um, you know, it so happened that on January 6th, when the, when the Capitol was being invaded, we were in our advanced reading group live like this. 
And um, Tim said he's he was worried that the army would come come up and take over the capital and impose martial law. And you know my response, which you know came from the unconscious because I didn't think about it, was no, they won't. They won't do that. And okay, from my training of 23 years as a Marine Corps officer, I knew that it wouldn't happen, but I couldn't, I didn't know why I said that, but now I do. And, and so, you know, this last week, it, for those of us who uh, are, are on the on the blue side of the equation in our national politics, uh, it was a pretty rough week, but I never had any doubt that things will be okay. Okay. I never th had a doubt about that. And I still don't. And I know that, that, um, you know, the Supreme Court is simply poked at a hornet's nest that they're not going to like very much in the coming few years. <laughs> and these things take a long time to play through the collective unconscious. But this is what we're seeing. We're seeing the collective unconscious, you know, do what I said, which was uh, that the diversity causes us as a national group to be different from everybody else. Okay, and um, and autocratic countries that don't allow. You have to be in group think or else, you know, if you say one thing that's not in in sync with everyone else, you're in deep trouble. Um, those countries are are held back very clearly. OK, and and it's, you know, it's it was clear about uh, about. Japan, it was even clearer about Nazi Germany that it would it could never be allowed. Um, and it won't be allowed this time either. And it you know it erupts from time to time, but uh, and sometimes it erupts in something like the Civil War. but um, but in the end it it balances out. And so anyway, next incantation. I forgive myself these words, as you also forgive me for wanting your blessing, your blazing light. Um, well, this is basically what I'm talking about. My comments on current affairs are my comments, but I forgive myself these words, as you also forgive me for wanting your blessing your blazing light um and so we would like to have the blazing light of truth um and um what do you what do you think he means skip i forgive myself these words well because he's he's taking a, a position uh, that may be counter to his upbringing. Um, he's he's not he's not posting the cow the party line. I'm not posting the party line, and when I speak my words, um, and my point is that it it truly doesn't matter because. Um, I mean, it's it's like Colleen and, and me versus Tim on the issue of artificial intelligence. Tim Tim's worried that artificial intelligence will destroy the human race, and it might. Okay, <laughs> if we if we do the wrong things with it, it could do that before there's time for the collective unconscious to react because. The collective unconscious reacts in generations. It doesn't react 
instantaneously, whereas AI does. Um, but, you know, Colleen says, and I concur, and I, I can't put my finger on the exact reason why I think that, but she says, no, it won't. Okay, no, it won't. It won't take, it won't destroy humanity. And it might be, uh, it might be um, pretty bad, um, but it won't destroy humanity. Um, and, you know, I think that we're already getting enough of a scare about it. So we're not going to hook it up to things <laughs> that could destroy us. You know, just as a species, we're not going to do that out of out of self protection, and um, so I might be wrong, but anyway, I I hear you. I feel like any traditional um, meditative, contemplative Buddhist teacher has, when asked that, has said the same thing. Right. We just we won't push the button, you know. Yeah. But I have a question on the footnote. Okay. For this, um, which is in transformation symbols of the libido, Jung discussed the Egyptian living sun disc and the motif of the sea monster. In his 1952 revision, he noted that the battle with the sea monster represented the attempt to free ego consciousness from the grip of the unconscious. And is that basically? the individuation process is uh, to get to know the unconscious so that you can be discerning and yeah. more integrated with your, and by ego, not necessarily puffed up persona, but your actually sense of authentic self. Yeah. 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 I mean, this, the C is, is probably the main um, metaphor for the unconscious and um, and it comes up everywhere okay and and so I was curious about the freeing part the grip you know in some sense Jung for this period of time when he was writing this was somewhat in the grip of the collective unconscious Brilliant. and maybe also the unconscious. He was in the grip of it and he was allowing it and yeah, letting it flow. Right. And, and, and definitely we have to remember that this is actually a very short period of time up until now that he's going through all this visionary stuff. I mean, in, in, um, in two and a half weeks, everything that we've talked about in the last year happens. Okay, we've been talking about it for a year, and it's only been actually some something like less than three weeks. And so it's a period of his, of time in his life where he's, you know, extraordinarily moved and He's he's dashing it all out in the red book. I read the black books, and um, you know nobody could take this onslaught for very long. Okay, um, and you know I went through a similar period for eight months once in 1993, uh, which I projected out of myself as a as a novel okay it came out as a novel uh which i'm not recommending people go read by the way um it's in, in some places it's pornographic I mean, being gentle it's erotic but it but it wasn't something in the physical world i was very proud of and my wife in her infinite wisdom this was at, at the same time that 
she was starting to move into Buddhism. Um, she said to me, I won't read it until you've had 10 other women read it. And so it was interesting because uh, I happened to work in an industry that is 90% women. And I had lots of women around who could read it. And they all loved it. <laughs> so finally, my wife and my mother also read it, and they loved it. So I'm not, it's, uh, I'm still not, it's not for public consumption, actually. But it is available on, on uh, Kindle, I guess. I put it out on Kindle in 2014, finally. After 21 years, I put it in my drawer for 20, for 21 years, and I promised myself that I would not publish it until I thought I was done with my my uh, physical world career. And then I did publish it, but only on Kindle, and nobody, very few have read it. But there's about isn't it um, under a pseudonym, Skip? Didn't yeah, you publish it under a pseudonym? Correct. Okay. I, I it's called Mako Memories Memoir of a Woman. And it's the memoir of the first woman prime minister of Japan. Okay. And it's under my pen name, David Garrett Son. Okay. David and what? Garrett Son. I, I changed Garrett Sen, which is uh, actually a family name. Uh, I will, let's see, I'll put it here okay. in, the, in the chat. Um, I changed it from Sen to Son uh, because David uh, Wolford Garrettson von Cohenhaven was the first American in my lineage, and he came to the New Amsterdam in 1625. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's so his name is Garrettson with an E, but I changed it to San related to Japan and the use of the term San as an honorific. And um, I guess I'll put it over here on YouTube. Sometimes. But what you're saying, too, is it just sort of wanted to pour out of you somewhat like Jung just. Yeah, I had no choice. I, I, yeah. I had no choice. I mean, I the the uh, the woman, the w Mako literally woke me up every morning. I mean, a vision of Mako uh, every morning uh for eight months and she wouldn't leave me alone until i finished until i had told her story and you know when i finished i said wow what just happened and what changed me a bit was that in when the red book came out in 2009 i said to myself wow if this could happen to the most famous psychiatrist, psychologist of the 20th century, um, then I guess it's okay that it happened to me. Okay, I mean, I recognize my experience and Jung's experience, although they were, you know, they had no plot <laughs> parallels whatsoever. Um, but any, anyway, obviously it was something that had to come out. And um, yeah, um, I don't. I don't know what else to say about it. It's, it's, I it, no, I appreciate it. I just was, you know, more curious about that freeing the ego consciousness from the grip of the unconscious. And it seems like part of the pathway is through active imagination. Is is reason. to get through it is to get yeah. through it okay once you once you start an archetype i think of archetypes as like 
records in a jukebox. Once they start playing, they don't stop until they're done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, the most powerful archetype is that of mother. And yeah. once once that archetype starts playing in a woman, it never ends in her lifetime. Okay. You can never escape that no matter what happens. You know, even if you leave your baby at the local fire station, you're never going to escape that archetype. Um, right. But, you know, there, there are other type archetypes, like the archetype of the warrior, um, which, you know, get old. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm very proud of the fact that I served the, my years in the Marines, but, and, you know, if I were ever in battle again, I would definitely like to have Marines around me. But, I, you know, I played that, that, record from the jukebox the warrior record and then i put it back on the in the machine right i never pulled it out again uh and i've been a different kind of warrior you could say uh in different ways and you know literally what i'm doing now I have no, no choice. I'm not making any money at this, not at all. I mean, I, okay, every so often, every two months, Amazon sends me a hundred bucks. Okay. But in no way is it compensation for the time that I've put into it over, over, you know, decades now. So, but in, in some ways, Skip isn't your warrior archetype that was worked with in the Marines in that structure. Aren't you bringing some of the wisdom of that to the 300 elementary school title oh, one? Assuredly, 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 because, uh, you know, if I didn't have that, I don't think I could have made it. I mean, I, I can't speak for, right. I can't speak a woman who's fresh out of art school who goes into teaching art and going into that environment. Right. I, I think she the run away with her hair on fire personally. Um, yeah. and if it hadn't been for my experience as a Marine, I'd, I wouldn't have made it. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, it's at, at 76 years old to be teaching art to that population of people, uh, in that volume. Oh my God, you, you can't imagine how difficult that is. And, and yet you know, my counterpart who was teaching the little kids You're frozen, Skip. What did I miss? More difficult by far than from what the Marines do. More difficult by far. Um, but but is it that the archetype, like at the beginning of these incantations, when he was talking about not proclaiming your, uh, not wearing your religion, not speaking, keeping it more inward with yourself, in some ways, isn't that archetypal energy too? Like you're keeping that warrior archetype, you're drawing from it internally, but you're not showing up in a military uniform. You know, well, actually, you're not... I did one day. Okay, actually, we <laughs> we we had a career day, and um, because I retired 33 years ago, I am privileged to wear my uniform, um, and I have actually gotten myself a new set of dress blues because my wife wanted me to do honor salutes at. Uh, for the hospice, okay. Hospice does these honor salutes. I don't know whether. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. I did wear my uniform one day, and um, let's see here. Share. And so here, here I am. This is my fourth set of dress blues. Um, and uh, and so there I am on that day, but um, I Powerful. didn't. 
I, but it was because of career day and they wanted me to, to talk about uh, military as a career and which I did. And, um, but I got very emotional about it. And it was interesting that this little first grade girl was walking by my room one day and she came in and she just gave me a spontaneous hug. And she said, I just wanted you to know that what you said was wonderful. And even when you wept, it was still wonderful. Okay. And wow. I, and, uh, you know, I find myself getting a little bit weepy right now because that was quite an archetypal experience for me as well, because I just gave a, like a two minute talk about serving in the military. And I was asked and the assistant principal came to my aid. And when I got weepy, uh, she stepped in for a bit and she said, well, we'll let you ask two questions. And one of the questions was, why did you do it? Why did you do it? And um, the answer I gave was very simply, um, I did it so that we could have this day today with you. Okay. Um, And, you know, obviously there's lots of stuff in my unconscious that isn't hard to bring up for me. I, I tend to, to get teary fairly often. Um, and, uh, but I mean, that, that's a button that you can push and, I, you know, I will surely become teary and, and I can't even tell you why that's true. I mean, I could tell you some things, but I don't want to tell you those things. And it's the same thing that, I mean, it answers the question, um, why did dear old dad never talk about the war when he came home? Okay. Why did dear old dad never talk about the war? And, um, when Debbie and I first got together and met his her parents, her father had been a sailor in World War II. He had been a, a first class petty officer. And he had a he had a pretty rough experience in the Navy. Okay. He spent two years on a merchant ship. Okay. So he you can imagine in World War II, he was one of five Navy men who were assigned to a merchant ship and during the war they were putting five inch guns on merchant ships in order for them to have some <laughs> manner of self-defense it's like carrying a pistol against an ar-15 or something like that right and um and all of a sudden and he had Parkinson's disease, so he was quite deteriorated by the time I met him. He had it for 15 years, and about five of those years was after I met Deb, so he was pretty far along in his Parkinson's. And when he met me, he started to tell war stories. And my mother-in-law says, you know, he never told us any of these stories. Um, until you came along and you know somehow he knew that I would understand them and I have the experience of working uh, for example at headquarters Marine Corps where um, people show up for work at two at six in the morning okay they literally physically show up at headquarters Marine Corps at six in the morning but what goes on for the first two hours until eight, which is the official 
start of work time, they tell war stories to one another. Okay. People tell war stories to one another. And then they do work, do whatever they're supposed to be doing for the day. They also feel free to dismiss themselves from work at like two in the afternoon. <laughs> I've been here since six, I can go now. <laughs> but but the point is that you know there there's some things that happen in war that can't be spoken. Okay, there's some things for women that happen in relationships that cannot be spoken. Um, and I'm sure you know what I mean. I I, I won't even go into it, and I would, it would be presumptuous of me to go into it. But I'm sure that there are some things that that are not spoken about okay, among women, um, except among women, okay, except in in groups of women, um, and you know they're they're analogous truly analogous yeah. um and we we hit at them around the edges um you know the wife of one of my uh followers locally said that when she was 12 years old she had been a tomboy her all her life and and when when the the boys had a separate health class and the girls had a separate health class and they learned what they learned in that health class they she was mad quote unquote she was mad okay now i won't go into why she was mad but uh you know she was still mad when i knew her in her 50s <laughs> um but in any case, um, if know, I, know, I know we're running out of time, but yeah, I'm I just have a wondering that the tears, the access of the subtle body that isn't so in our conscious control, right, is a portal. Like when you tear up, like there's a portal to the unconscious that's opening, that's happening, and maybe even the collective, that those tears, like that emotion. You know, it's not rational, but it's not irrational. You know, yeah. it's it's right. non-rational. And yeah. I feel like that often if we slow down or appreciate it or allow that level of feeling, which like you said, even giving the talk at the school, you were sort of a little bit embarrassed that you teared up because that's not our masculine archetype. Yeah. And right. yet, more and more, the the more human human being, uh, I think, access well, to and, and and that's what opens a path to the unconscious. Okay, right. And and that's why what we're doing in confluence this year is so important because what we're doing is okay. I can tell you some some things that we're going to physically do around the edges but i cannot express to you what will happen to us and to you when you're there because we are trying to open that portal to the collective unconscious we are intentionally doing that and um And that's what it's about, okay? And But that's what all of these things do, okay, in some way. And so we may be rueful about what the Supreme Court has done this week, but we weren't so rueful in 2015 when gay marriage was allowed, okay? There was, there was cheering in the streets when that happened. And... What we have to understand is that the what happens in the collective unconscious um, takes decades to manifest fully, okay, and and to appreciate fully, okay. What what surprised me last year in Confluence was I figured, wow, we could invite 
local churches to come and to you know see what we see and so i wrote to 100 local churches in the helena montana area 100 okay what i found out was that half of them do not have an ordained pastor from a traditional protestant sect not at all okay they're they're not ordained people um and that was surprising but not a soul came from those communities not a single one uh it could be that one came from the jewish community I, there was one man that may have come from the jewish community uh because he was intrigued by the fact that we were going to perform the analyst and the rabbi but um but not a soul who didn't know us i mean people who came were people that knew tim from the local community they weren't people from any of the other environment and so everybody's hunkered down with their own thing that is satisfied them and they they won't look at the others okay they don't look at the others and so you know we have a history of looking away from one another and of having religious wars all the time banging against each other uh and you know my my ancestors came to the new world in 1625 to escape the 80 years war we actually warred 80 years where the the spanish catholics would come up to netherlands for 80 years every summer and try to beat the dutch into becoming catholic and the dutch were calvinists by that time and every year the dutch would at, after harvest would flood their country and the spanish would go home to sunny spain for the winter <laughs> that was the 80 years war that was the essence of it um and it, and it didn't end until 1648 so it, in 1625 my ancestor who was a farmer and a baker uh had the opportunity to get on a, a very leaky ship uh and sail to new amsterdam and so his his family uh were five of the first 150 european settlers on manhattan island okay um but they were escaping a religious war even then okay that's what it was about it wasn't about great uh you know wonder about creating a new country or any other thing it was just getting away from a religious war i, I just want to farm <laughs> and and so two two firms that he founded uh appear on the earliest map of Ma manhattan island that they sell at the library of congress um it's called the bing boom map and it was created in 1639 so even then still nine years before the treaty of westphalia and uh his his two farms are on it one of them is is now sort of the the basis of the brooklyn side of the brooklyn bridge and the other uh is we call it jfk airport now <laughs> uh but he moved out of there too early because he then went up to albany and founded albany and rensselaer also uh so he was a busy guy and he came to the new world when he was 40. but um i don't know why i told that story but anyway uh it, his name is sort of there in my pen name uh which is well you were talking about the confluence being sort of the antithesis to that that of looking away from each other or the religious wars you were naming right. that the confluence was coming together and and, and looking looking toward each other right. so we've been other. like this and we have to be like this yes it's going to take centuries for that to happen as a species we have to 
realize that the temple is built like this. The temple of unity is built like this. It's not built like this. Uh, and, um, you know, is that why we all pray like that? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, all right, we'll do a few more of these incantations next week. I hope it's been uh, useful. We still have 15 people watching from YouTube. So, uh, and thank you, Skip. We and thanks everybody you know, coming. We let, yeah, we literally get hundreds who come back and listen to these later on. So, um, yeah, you know, it seems Thank like you. it's worthwhile. Uh, and um, I don't know. You know, Jung didn't understand the collective unconscious when he was discovering it. He didn't understand it. Right. And this period we're looking at in the Red Book is the period where he did not understand it. He didn't know what was happening to him. And he was just trying to cope with it. But, you know, once he went through this visioning period, which most of it happened within two and a half weeks, and some of it happened sometime in the next five years. Um, but he, he spent 16 years noting it and that's what we have in the red book now i just want to say one prideful thing this week i completed reading the black books okay Whoa. i i i just want to emphasize what that means okay i completed reading the seven volumes of the black books cover to cover um and i have every book marked to um to prove it <laughs> and so um i do want to work do the same exercise on the black books because they are so different from the red books and, that's great and it's so important to see the choices that young made or the chandasani made maybe uh because Shandasani had the red book and he had the black book. So, yes, Jung made because Jung, in that 16 year period, transposed what happened in the black books into the red book. So, he made decisions during this period about what would be included in the red book and what would not. Okay. And that is of, of significance. Um, and it's, I mean, if you're really into Jung, ultimately you have to read the black books. And I'd be given, I'd, I'd be surprised if more than ten people have read them, cover to cover. I mean, Sernishan Dasani has. Uh, I mean, since publication, the publishers obviously read them, but. Um, and Sean Dasani dedicated ten years to publishing the black books, which contain both the, both the handwritten um, German, which Jung actually wrote it in. So we have facsimile copies of every black book in, in their entirety. That's an amazing thing, because the first book, the first half of each of these volumes is the facsimile of the black book itself. And the last section is Sean Dasani's translation of that particular black book. And it's obvious that Sean Dasani made decisions both about what he would put in the red book as we have it now in English, because he's the translator of that as well. Um, and um, and uh, so he made decisions, but also seeing Jung's decisions are very re relevant, okay? And I've known this for a year because I started reading last August, I, and I started with volume seven, and I don't know why I started at volume seven. I just, for some reason, that volume in the set is taller than the other six volumes. I don't know why that is. I still don't know why but it's taller 
And so for some reason that was sticking out to me. So I started with volume seven and it's only when I got to the end of volume six that I realized that that is as far as Shem Dasani went with the Red Book. And as far, also it's as far as Jung went. Okay, in other words, volume six ends where Jung ended in the Red Book. And volume seven is other stuff that happened between 1928 and 1936, basically that are in volume seven of the red book but i didn't know that until i read the last 14 pages of volume six i i just for some reason i read volume seven first and it was a volume that jung had written after the red book period that was an interesting point so i leave you with that um I don't know how many people have read the black books, but uh, this, as long as I can breathe and do this, and afford with my computer, I'll, I'll keep it going because I want to. I want to go through the the black books now. I'm very Thanks, yeah. So. Mm -hmm.